Hi, and welcome to What Sex Got to Do With It. I'm your host, Leonard Diggins, and I'm here with the author of the book, Heather Remoff. And we are now about to cover the first chapter in the book, which is called In the Beginning. Why In the Beginning? Well, I, I sort of wanted, I actually wrote that after the book was finished. And I thought, gee, I really ought to alert readers as to what's coming because I believe that I'm offering a fairly significant challenge to Darwin's theory of sexual selection. And it's very, very difficult to suggest a paradigm shift in a theory that's as widely accepted as Darwin's is. And I really think that particularly the theory of sexual selection, but even the theory of natural selection, there are some things that we, we really ought to be looking at a little bit differently. And so I, I wanted to give the reader a heads up. You know, you're going to be asked to consider Darwin in a different light in this book. And at the end of that, that, that first uh, chapter, the preface, I, I end by asking the reader to engage with me. My, and like, as I mentioned earlier, you're my dream reader. Someone who would engage with me, engage with my ideas. Yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way before. Maybe come up with your ideas of your own. Challenge me a little bit. But, but be, th be open to the idea that the way we viewed sexual selection is not the whole story. In fact, I think Darwin got sexual selection very wrong. Interestingly enough, sexual selection is Dar the one theory that is truly Darwin's own. The theory of natural selection, lots of people have been right. coming up with, uh, not just Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, Darwin's grandfather right. was an advocate of uh, natural selection. Um, and Wallace and Darwin both came up with the mechanism for how natural selection would work by reading uh, Thomas Malthus's right. essay on population. And right. I think Malth Malthus got a whole lot wrong. So right. I think I refer to Darwin's Malthusian flaw right. and, the, and the ways that he was influenced by Malthus. But this, his book on sexual, or his, uh, the discussion of sexual selection appeared in the book The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. So it was in that book that Darwin talked about human evolution. He didn't really relate the two completely. I think at one point he said, well, he considered them both in the same book because that's when he was first afforded the opportunity to do so. But um, The Descent of Man, if he if he'd had the theory of sexual selection a little more accurate, his understanding of human evolution would be of, of our species-specific behavior. I think he missed an opportunity to have a clear understanding of what our species-specific behavior is. I mean, so the theory of sexual selection was inspired by Darwin's inability to explain the beauty of the peacock's tail, hence these peacock feathers around us. He, it, he said it made him sick to look at a peacock's tail because he couldn't explain how that could be functional enough to have evolved. And so he came up with the theory of sexual selection as a th he focused on beauty, selection for beauty. Well, I believe that Darwin and many male biologists who have followed him, and female too, project the thing that drives their own attraction, which is beauty, project it onto the female that's doing the selection and assume that females select for beauty. Darwin acknowledged, he believed that, that female choice drove sexual selection. He happened to not believe that women were any longer s smart enough, civilized women were no longer smart enough to make such choices, but felt that it had served in the past to drive human evolution. Darwin was very misogynist. Um, but I think that he projected the thing that would have driven his selection, which would be the beauty, youth and beauty, as I say in a later chapter, onto the females doing the selecting, because he acknowledged that females drove, drove sexual selection. It was female choice that drove sexual selection. But um, 
so I, I think that that's, you know, I, in a later chapter I talk about uh, why selection for the peacock's tail was not for beauty. It was a way of telling the boys from the girls. Right, right. <laughs> but, yes. So I was intrigued by the use of In the Beginning because I mean, it is a book about evolution. I mean, and In the Beginning, as you know, is biblical. I mean, right. And so, so, so I was wondering if you were somehow drawing a contrast between evolution and creationism. You know, and clearly that wasn't the intent at all. And, and if it were, I was just kind of wondering how that really fit in with where you were taking things. But clearly that wasn't the case. So I, I now have the answer to my question. But, but then when, for example, I would I'd chat with somebody on the bus about what a lecture I'd just been to at Harvard and would mention that I was writing a book about evolution, a challenge to Darwin. I would feel people edge away from me, assuming that I was a creationist. Oh, sure. That, that if... Oh, right, because the challenge because to Darwin. Uh, the yeah. challenge yeah. to Darwin, right. they assume it's creationism. Right. No, 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 not at all. Yeah, right. I just want Darwin to get it right. Yeah. And... and I, I'm forgetting the, the main points that I made in the preface, the things that I was going to be talking about. Right. One was uh, female choice and right. sexual selection, how there's been an understanding of the traits that... Uh, well, first of all, women have... How can you write a theory of human evolution and ignore, totally ignore, the behavior of 51% of the population? Because women are 51% right. of the population, which Darwin did because he assumed women weren't smart enough to be making choices. Uh, so how can you expect that theory to be accurate? You, so what I do is I look at sexual selection through a female lens. Right. And that's what my research at Rutgers was. Right. I interviewed women about how they selected the men in their lives. Right. I took a tape recorder, right. just sat down and had informal conversations that ran from three to five hours in length and ask them to describe real men in their lives. Right. What was it? Uh, what was it about him? How did you meet? Right. Tried not to, to ask any leading questions. Right. And women love to talk about the men in their lives. I mostly just had to say, uh-huh, uh-huh. Right, right. When I later, I would have, I, I didn't type at the time, so I paid someone right. to transcribe the tapes for me. When I went back through them, I realized, oh, I have to be very careful not to say, oh, that's interesting, because right. as soon as I would say that, I'd get a flood of information right. in the same vein. So I tried to stay pretty neutral, but I interviewed women, and I was a thorough Darwinist at the time, absolutely, you know, Charles Darwin was my hero, mm -hmm. absolutely. And so I assumed that I would find out that the men, that the women, through their viewpoint, described it's the most successful, that those men would have the greatest reproductive success, that they would sire more children. Quite the opposite was true, as you are probably aware in humans. Uh, people with a good control of resources who are generally considered successful have fewer children. They can limit the number of children they have and still have reproductive success. So my research, just like my research at, at, at UMKC, or at, yeah, at UMKC on, on testosterone in women, I got the exact opposite of what I expected. And I realized that, oh, 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 Darwin, neither Darwin nor I know enough about evolution. And so I left uh, Rutgers and began as, as to self-educate are not enough about evolution, enough about economics, and began to self-educate in the field of economics because I knew, I, from my research, I knew, I knew, I knew that economic behavior was driving uh, the choices that women made. So I'm very much focused on looking at sexual selection through the eyes of the women exercising female choice. And it's not just for beauty, it's for a whole range of traits that women select, the traits that, um, that make us who we are as humans. And so, you know, that's one of the things I focused on. The other thing I wanted to give people a heads up, um, my reader, a heads up, that language was going to be very, very right. important. And, um, and the, that um, social, the ability, I'm, 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 the ability, I'm, fr I'm forgetting where I was going with that. I'm sorry. I'm okay. sorry. I'm sorry, Len. Um, 
That's okay. The There's symbolic, no, yeah. the symbolic nature of human language gives us symbolic control of, of, of resources, yeah. natural resources. And that is the major difference between humans and other species. Other species control the resources right. they need with their own bodies. Right. And so they, they have an equitable share of resources because their bodies are pretty, their physical right. strength is pretty much the same right. between, but with humans, yeah. we control resources symbolically. Right. Right. And so yeah. uh, a Jeff well, Bezos or an Elon Musk, right. they can control right. so many more resources. Yeah. And we're definitely going to get to that later yeah. on. I know that's coming. But, but that's, you know? that's one yeah. of the things I right. wanted to give people a heads right. up. I'm going to be talking about right. female choice from a female point of view. I'm going to be talking about symbolic control of resources. I'm going to be talking about language ability. And also, um, The way we see what we expect to see, right. and therefore don't see, um, don't see what's really there. Right. Gotcha. You know, we, we see what we expect to see, and Darwin himself did. Right. When he looked at the fossil record, and for example, the Cambrian explosion, and suddenly there are all these new fossils, he can't see that that has any implication to his theory because that's not what he's expecting right, right, to right, see right. there. Yeah. Uh, confirmation bias was yeah. the, the phrase I was looking for. Right. That we all suffer from confirmation right. bias. It's very hard to see a truth that we're not, or to see the truth of something right. that we don't expect to see. We just, for example, when I lose something and I'm looking for it, right. if I think I'm looking for a red book, I can look at exactly the book I'm looking right, for. Right, right. It happened to have had a blue cover, but I right. forgot the color. Right. So you, you don't see what you're, you're not expecting to see. Yeah. And so I bring that up, I think, a lot in, in the beginning, too, that I want my reader to be aware that we all have confirmation bias, and we have to sort of drop our assumption about um, what we think we know about evolution and be willing to come at it uh, right. with a fresh eye. Right. So you, um, you mentioned several times to me that he, it's the male biologists that have a hard time seeing things differently. But then you also mentioned that some women scientists too. Mm -hmm. But are you, are you finding more reception to... Um, your um, theory, you know, um, or or your um, what you have learned, I mean, amongst, I mean, female biologists that you not, talk. Not yet. Right. <laughs> the the book will just be released in the states. It's yeah. scheduled for release on April twenty eighth. Right. You're the first person who's read it who has a background in the sciences, yeah. and I cannot tell you how gratified I am that you read it and pronounced it excellent. <laughs> and I thought, what, what? Because I am so very used to not having people able to hear me. Right. And I think some of that, I, I don't mean to be a whiner, I hope I don't sound like a whiner. Some of that is the fact that I'm a woman and yeah. I'm female. And in the book, I, I kind of understand why men and women both overlook female behavior. There's an evolutionary explanation for that. But um, even at Rutgers, where I, I had such great mentors right. and people were so helpful to me and and gave me so many opportunities because it was sociobiology back at that time. Um, the feminists just really hated Lionel Tiger and Robin Fox probably still do. Like Lionel, they would stamp stickers on his door that said, this discriminates against women. What was so funny, I was his graduate assistant there was probably the smartest woman in our department was a cultural anthropologist, my degree, my PhD is actually in anthropology. And she worked for a, a well-known feminist anthropologist in the department and as, as her graduate assistant, back then it was mimeograph machines. Vicky got to run the mimeograph machine. Lionel, who supposedly discriminated against woman, women, had me co-edit a book with him and put my name on the title of it. So, um, you know, I got lots and lots of opportunities at Rutgers, but even there. So I give that as a preface because my mentors were wonderfully supportive of me, both Lionel and Robin, and, and Robert Trivers as well. But 
people tended to focus on one of my findings in the interviews I did with women was the importance of courtship feeding. Mm -hmm. And people tended to focus on that because that was fun. And it's not just that men take women out for dinner as part of the dating scene. You know, I, I this comes up in a later chapter, but I, you know, it was the very end of doing all these hundreds of hours of interviews and I interviewed a woman who was married to an airline pilot and I asked her, she said her husband was the sexiest man alive, bar none. And I asked her, I said, wow, you know, what traits, what traits give him that title? And she couldn't think of any. She was so embarrassed. I said, well, think about the last time he made you feel that way. I'm, I'm at the end of the, my interviews. I'm coaching her a little bit. I said, what did he do? What did he do that made you feel that way? And she said, oh, I know, I know. He brought me two pineapples. He brought me two fresh pineapples. And at that moment, I thought, ah, I pictured a little lizard with a bug in its mouth, right. rain, or a male cardinal feeding right. a female cardinal uh, sunflower seed. Right. I thought courtship feeding in humans. And I went back. I hadn't taken any notes on it, but it was everywhere. Not uh, women, When women would start describing meals they'd had 20 years before, oh, I had the shrimp scampi, Oh, with a Caesar salad, I stopped paying attention because I thought, right, okay. right, right, right. but the tape recorder was paying attention. Right, right, right. So it was everywhere. And it's not just the fact of going out for a meal. They were describing in detail what they ate right, the, right before they had sex for the first time. So I saw the link right away. Oh, wow, courtship feeding in humans. I think I'm the first person to document that. So it was very fun for my mentors and my peers, the other grad students, I got to be known for that, and they had a rather four-letter word description of my theory of evolution. But the really important thing that I discovered was this link between how with secure economics, right. birth rate dropped. That was my significant discovery in humans, and that it was too much fun to talk about courtship feeding. Economics is not as much fun to talk about, I agree. Um, but that was my significant discovery, and that is my, my challenge to Darwin. Darwin himself understood that. In, in The Descent of Man, he pointed out that the superior, he made the mistake of confusing um, wealth with genetic superiority, right. which is a very big mistake to make, but one made most often by those with great fortunes. But he felt that, in his words, that um, since the most successful members of the species were having the fewest children, the, spirit, the species would retrograde right. unless we changed our behavior. Now, he, that was, he was thinking of British women not having, upper class British women not having enough children. He was very concerned that Irish women right. and poor women were having a lot of children. Right. So his own biases in, against the poor and the Irish influenced his theory of evolution and his own confirmation bias about his own theory. He could see that the most successful members had the fewest children but he didn't let it challenge his theory because according to his theory of natural selection, that should not be happen, happening. So that's the kind of confirmation bias. Darwin himself couldn't see his own. Right. And, and, and that's certainly we'll be getting into that a lot more in some of the, yeah. the subsequent chapters. So in this first chapter, you also mentioned an encounter with, um, well, not an encounter, but you... Um, talk about T Terence Deacon being and 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 um he, and how he written a book called the symbolic species the coevolution a language in the brain and how he actually you thought that he understood where understood things the way you did in about the role of sexual selection and then he wrote a paper or something mm -hmm. and, and then he said but since me this doesn't relate result in sexual dimorphism. It can't be the basis of sexual selection. And, and I guess it, I understand where you're coming from. And I, 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 what I, I kind of see as the, the issue is that it isn't that the thing that results isn't sexually dimorphic. I mean, um, uh, 
it's the fact that people don't see that as the thing that people mean or or looking at I mean, that, that, I, let me rephrase that that is used I mean as part of the behavior I mean, that leads to I mean, the sexual selection I mean, and, and so uh, and so so language may not be sexually dimorphic at least inherently so you know uh, but perhaps the way someone uses it is I mean, uh, 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 so if we so would we say that maybe like m women and men and women use language differently perhaps yeah. um, I, I think the thing that may help the viewer understand yeah. sexual dimorphism and and sexual selection sexual selection was assumed to always result in sexually dimorphic traits for example the peacock's tail that drove Darwin so crazy obviously the male peacock tail is very different from the female peacock tail and Darwin assumed that's because women are female the, the peahen right. selected for the beauty of the tail therefore only the peacocks would have these gorgeous tails not the peahens so he assumed that sexual selection always related resulted in sexually dimorphic traits traits that where there was a dramatic difference between the male and the female of the species the gigantic antlers of the Irish elk right. um, you know he assumed that female elk selected for those giant antlers and that's why they the males had them and not the females so when i had done my research on you know interviewing all these women and i would go around to conferences and talk give presentations and you know this was like a, the, a conference of biobehavioral science for example i would speak to auditoriums packed with mostly men, because it was mostly male scientists, very curious about the traits that made men sexually attractive to women. That's why they were there. And I'm sure that I'm talking about sexual selection. After all, it's females. These are the traits that they like in men and that made them select the men that they had sex with or married or fell in love with, whatever. And at the end of every talk, it was invariable that the first hand that went up in the Q&A would be a man who would say, oh, well, this is all very interesting, but it's not sexual selection. And I was so puzzled by right, that. Right. I was so puzzled by it that I'm angry at myself now. I didn't even ask, well, why not? I just sort of was dumbfounded by it. But it happened again and again. And I, I thought, why am I having so much trouble getting these scientists to understand that my work is about sexual selection. It's about the traits that made women select the men in their lives. And it was only while I was writing my book here, because Terence Deacon is great on language. He's my favorite theorist on language. On Oh, he's uh, uh, language in the brain. He's a, uh, a neuroanthropologist or neurobiologist. I mean, he really understands neurology. His book is fabulous, and he really, re so I think he's one of them, just a brilliant theorist. And so I'm, I, I decided, I, I'd heard him do a YouTube feature in which I thought he alluded to the fact that he expected that sexual selection would result in males and females having different language abilities. I thought that can't be true. So I was Googling to try to find that. I thought, surely I misheard him. I discovered a research paper that he'd written, and you know, he and Robert Trivers had uh, talked about the ideas in it. And um, Terence Deacon, one of the men I really admire for his brilliance, he said, well, of course, sexual uh, language ability can't be the result of sexual selection or it would be sexually dimorphic. Um, men would be much more, uh, would be skilled in language and women wouldn't be. And I thought, what? I went back, I reread that. I thought, what, what, what? That was the light went off. I was, that was while I was writing this book, I discovered that. And um, I realized, that's why all those men were telling me it wasn't sexual selection, because they think unless it results in traits that are dramatically right. different between men and women, then it's not sexual selection. And it was that was the moment the light went off for me. I thought, oh, that's why men don't get this. 
that's why they don't credit women. And it's more, it's, I think it's more significant in, in misunderstanding how humans evolved than it is in any other species. But we don't, we don't look at female behavior in that regard in other species because we just assume they're only selecting for sexually dimorphic traits. I can't believe that's true in any species as I, you know, in parts of the book I talk about birds and stuff and uh -huh. how I, I indicate that there has to be more going on than just beauty here. Right, right, right. And, even, and, and even though I phrased the question in a way that made it seem like I was subscribing to the notion that language could be used in a way that would reveal some sexual dimorphism. I mean, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I was just kind of wondering if language was maybe the right one to use because, because to a certain extent, I think that it can have some sexually dimorphic traits. You know, uh, and, and, Certainly and, lots and, of people assume that women are more verbal than men, but uh, you look at all the great authors, their skill with language, great male authors, male and female authors, of course. Yeah. But I, I, you know, the whole men are from Mars, right. women are right. from Venus. Right. You know, I do think male, men and women have different uh, communication styles. Again, yeah. again, uh, 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 Lionel Tiger has a I don't mean to act like these are all universals, all completely under the control of biology, because I don't believe they are. Lionel Tiger had a great line, biology is not destiny, it's statistical probability. So when I make general statements right. like men and women might yeah. Right, have different communication styles. That's statistical probability that you can't predict exactly that that would be true. You can't look at any one woman and say yeah. her language skills are going to be superior to, yeah. for example, uh -huh. yours. Uh -huh. So, uh -huh. so I don't want to. I don't want to give the viewer the uh -huh. idea that we think that's that's that. To say that there's a biological underpinning to behavior right. doesn't mean that you can predict behavior based on that. Right, 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 and, and I mean that really sets the stage for a lot more conversation, and 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 I find myself really wanting to talk about this chapter one uh, even more. But you know what? I mean, we actually talked about some other chapters, you know, while well, talking about chapter one. So I think when we talk about some of those other chapters, I'll come back to some things that I wanted to talk about sure. in 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 chapter one. You know? And so I think this is a, a good start, I mean, to us exploring your wonderful book, I mean, and so there are 15 more chapters to wow. go. <laughs> and, and even though you think that's a lot, I think we'll find it's gonna go by really fast. So thank you so much, Heather. Well, thanks, Len, uh, this and, is fun. And looking it, forward to fun. more. All right.